jubilation for Nigerians, but heartbreak for South Africa. As the Super Eagles defeated Bafana Bafana on penalties to reach the final of the Africa Cup of Nations, Kelechi Hernacho scored the winning penalty as Nigeria won the shootout 4-2 to qualify for the final. The game in Buake finished 1-1 following a remarkable 90 minutes. President Bola Tinubu has expressed pride and support for the Super Eagles. On his official Twitter account, President Tinubu said a resounding well done boys and encouraged the team to soar even higher in the finals. And Vice President Kashim Shetima was in Cote d'Ivoire for the big game. Here he is with the rest of the team after that hard-fought victory. <laughs> Yes, the Super Eagles are in the final of the African Cup of Nations. Correspondent Uvieteme George, who was at the Sports Viewing Center in Yenagua, captured moments of a match which generated so much tension in the country. There was tension in the air at this Sports Viewing Center in Yenagua. And then Victor Osimen wins a penalty in the second half. Yes! Captain Fantastic Trust Ekong scores to give Nigeria the lead. The Nigerian hero in the However, Teboho Mokwena's 90th minute equalizer brings gloom to the faces of some who could barely watch him take the spot kick. A missed penalty for the Super Eagles and two for the Bafana Bafana leaves Kelechi Senior Man Kells in Hanacho to win it for Nigeria. For what I've seen tonight, we have a determined bunch who wants to bring the cup to Nigeria and I believe they can do it. Congratulations Nigeria, let's pray for the cup to come home, even at these hard times, you understand? Nobody is happy, it's only football that can bring happiness to the faces of Nigerians. We are happy right now, but I hope that this can translate into bringing the cup to Nigeria. This was a coach, people ambassador, nobody gave him a chance. He was called all sorts of names before this competition started. But I think he's a man worth his onions. He knew what he was doing. He took his time, nurtured the team, and look at where we are. Giving us a sweet victory against a South African team. It could be 3-1, it could be 3-0 in the final match. We are going to come out smoking. We've never had a team as organized, as coordinated, as the Super Eagles we have right now. The South Africans are relying on penalties. But penalties is only the one the keeper sees he can catch. And if our players are able to place their penalties very well, he can't even see anyone to catch. And that's exactly what happened. Penalties is anybody's game. Not because you won the last game via penalties and you think it's going to happen again. But overall, I think uh, we're good to go. You can see how happy the fans here at this viewing centre. To them, Wambali is the hero of the night. The Super Eagles have made it to the finals of the AFCON. And now the hope and expectations is for them to bring the trophy home in a country where there are harsh economic realities. This will be something to cheer and celebrate. From Yenagoa, the Bayelsa State Capital, of Yetebe George, Arise News. Wabali, yes. Wabali Stanley Bobo, man of the match. Man of the match. And it's Nigeria's first half come final since 2013. Let's take a look at the celebrations following the victory.
Joining us now on the show is Sunday Olisa, former Super Eagles coach and 1994 AFCON winning team member. He will be joined by Victor Isiji, former Super Eagles player and CAF Champions League winner with Aimba Football Club of Aba. Gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, uh, Sunday Olisa. Good morning. Yes, thank you very much for joining us. You are joining from, uh, I guess, Belgium, right? Yeah, I'm at home, yeah. Yes, okay. Well, quickly, does this remind you of that moment of glory in 1994? And what's your impression so far? Um, do you think, you know, we'll repeat the feat and win that trophy fourth time, as we're hoping we'll be able to do? And uh, to you, uh, Victor Izeji, you say we're good to go. Well, I agree with you, but what should we watch out for? Because it looks like Ivory Coast... The second host country to uh, the first host country to get to the final after Egypt in uh, 2006, they are not going to on that pitch on Sunday to uh, to also Joko. They want to. They also they also want to win. But let's start with uh, you know uh, uh, Sunday Olisa. Uh, thanks for having me. Well, it brings back lots of memories, but I must confess that congratulations to Nigerians because. Um, the suffering and the hardship in Nigeria now, we needed something to distract us. And this is great distraction for us. When you're buying bag of rice over 60,000, so you know what it is like to be able to get victors like this. It reminds me especially of 94 because even the semifinals in 1994, we won it by penalties also against Cote d'Ivoire yeah. uh, to get to the finals. So it has a lot of meanings. And the team itself, I must say in the first half, I was worried because the South Africans found loopholes everywhere in us. And if we had been 0-1 down at first half, it would have been something that would have been a bit acceptable. But I must commend the, at the attitude of the players, especially when it comes to individual talents and efforts that came up in the second half. And the Niger swag, you know, like presence. And I really liked it. I know I've, people have been, have been criticizing that I'm complimenting too much um, Osimen. Because, but if you're a coach and you see your striker giving in so much, even if he's not scoring goals, but he's creating scoring chances, he's bonding the opposition defense, and he created the penalties now. This boy has been great for us. And what can I say? The star of the day, Mwabali, from the beginning, the first day I saw him play, especially, the, and he was smiling. Even when he made an error, I said, okay, this man is smart. In fact, I've been very, very happy because uh, it's a big relief for me because I've, I was mocked a lot by my FIFA colleagues during the World Cup for Nigeria's absence. So I'm really happy now. I can look at everybody in the face and say, yes, we are back. Well, uh, Victor, Ezechi, over to you. Uh, all right. Uh, good morning, uh, Doc. Good morning, Rufaya. Good morning, Ayo. Yeah, I, I said we're good to go, and there is no two ways about it. Even you, Doc, I'm very sure you know we're good to go. Because yesterday, you also predicted you want us to meet Cote d'Ivoire in the finals. And that's exactly what has happened. If you watch the game, we, the way we have played, we have progressed from one game to the other. From the next game, we move to the next one. From the one to the next one. It tells you that the players, they know exactly what they are doing. And we, we can all see it. It is very clear. The only thing that will make us not to win that cup is Nigeria losing to Nigeria. But as it stands now, I'm, I'm not trying to be overconfident, but you can see that the players understand. They are their highest ranked so far that is still in the, continent, in the, still in the competition. And you can see every other team has been out. So they believe this is their chance to take it. This opportunity might never come in their lifetime again. So they have to seize this opportunity. And that's why we're saying we have attackers that are faster than the, the Ivorians' defense. So that's another edge that we have over them. Again, yes, we know they have the 12th man, which will be very supportive to, to push them through the finish line. But they, even at that, I am extremely sure that we will definitely come home with that trophy. The, the team says, let's do it again. And we're almost there. We're, we're back crossing the finish line. So I don't see uh, Cote d'Ivoire stopping us from crossing that finish line. Oh, I love your confidence, Victor. That's the confidence of all of us here as well. We're confident, we are optimistic that that cup is coming home. But let me ask you, um, yesterday, mixed feelings, the first half, it was said that the Super Eagles perhaps didn't bring their best foot forward and a few things that didn't quite seem right, especially in the, in the midfield area. However, I'd like for, and this question is for both of you, 
What are some of the lessons that we can take forward to present a stronger team from start to finish um, on Sunday? And besides that, what are, what are some of the changes, if any, that the coach should make with regards to player selections, first team, who should be playing on Sunday? What should the pitch look like on Sunday? This question, I'll start with um, you Sunday, and then of course, Victor afterwards. Well, as regards the coach, I think we should all keep away. We, sh we shouldn't give you advice. The man has done it till now, let him do his job. I'm a coach also, so I think you should let the man do his work. He's, um, as regards the fact that we're dominated in the midfield, with the formation Nigeria is playing, you should expect that. We play a very packed defense. We're practically playing five defenders. So that, and, so that means that if you play five defenders, you must, you must be missing players in the midfield because you have to take from the midfield to cover the defense. So far, it's gotten us this far. And in this tournament, very few teams have been able to pick us out like the way the South Africans did in the first half. But this, the final is going to be a total different scenario because we just, the, every team knows that you just score one, you close the door, you might win it. And um, in the, the, what we should worry mostly about the Cozy Warren's team, they have two players we have to worry about. The striker, the point striker, is a big problem for us. It will be a big problem for us. And so far, I think our central defense, um, they've been doing well, but this one will be a very big test for us. All right. Uh, Victor? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm not a coach. Uh, I'll, I'll agree with uh, Sino Lise. Uh, he has said it from the coach uh, angle. But, but the truth is, uh, let's not deceive ourselves. We always know that we've had this problem in the midfield. After the likes of the JJ left the scene, we've not had that creative midfielder who can say that gives every attacker that half pass that you know this is a sure goal. We've not had that. But somehow the players have managed you know, to churn out results. So for me, I think it's better for the coach to decide whoever he wants to play. We've not been deciding for him before now and he's been getting his results. You know, like the saying goes that the coach is as good as his last game. The, the coach has been so criticized. So now that he's doing well, let's give him that leverage to decide whatever he wants to define but that of the midfield we know that there is always a problem in the midfield for now see we're able to rectify that that's the only way we can know yes we are we are really set you know initially we had problem in goalkeeping department that has been taken care of and i think uh Wabale must have studied the way vincent Iyama has has kept me vincent was my roommate in aimba so when i see him i see vincent everything he does is is vincent like you know so but overall i think we should just allow the coach to do his job while we we continue to look for, for creative midfielders after this AFCON. All right, uh, Gary, good to see you both, uh, Sunday, Olise, and uh, great to see you again, and uh, uh, Victor SAG. Uh, so I, I, I have two questions. One will be memory lane. I mean, do you see a replica of that 94 team? And I know this will quite be emotional for you, Sunday, Olise. Do you see a lot of Rashidi Yakini in Osime? the drive, the fight, the hunger, and the power, and the dedication at which he plays. And how can, you know, we channel that level of courage you guys had in 94, you know, to win in this tournament, which I know we're going to win. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have a good time on Sunday, into Monday. I know it, or I can feel it in my spirit already. Secondly, I'm going to ask the inconvenient question. In 94, when you guys won, Promises were made, but they were not fulfilled until, I mean, I felt sad that it was in his 80s, Clemens Westerhoff just got the house that was promised. A lot of promises were made and nothing was fulfilled. Can we mm. talk about that? That's why I kept on calling. Hope the promises made this time will not be just audio. Because it's a very important <laughs> part we don't like to talk about. I want you to answer that. And for you, you know, uh, Victor Eseji, one thing that reigned supreme was the strength of the South African League yesterday. About seven players were from a particular team. I'd give it to them, the league is good. You played in the year, but you did a lot of great things in the league. How can we build our league to be able to look inwards? I know Wabali is from our league, but we need more from this our league. I'd like Sonny Lisa to come first, and afterwards, uh, Victor Seji comes afterwards. Well, it's emotional because I had a special relationship with Rashidi. And um, um, the, thing, the thing there is that um, when you look at Osimen, he's, he's a bit ganglion like Rashidi. He's a bit like, you know, he's almost the same frame. But the difference is that Osimen is 
There are two different players when it comes to the way they approach finishing. Rashidi is a third clinical finisher. He doesn't need he doesn't need um, much um, chances to score. And um, but they are very very similar. But playing in two different generations, I would it would be unfair to start comparing both. In as much as I still feel Rashidi is the best striker Nigeria point striker Nigeria ever had. But that notwithstanding, he was very very clinical. And Dr. Simon is also uh, pulling his own weight now. And don't forget, Osimhen is now African Player of the Year. He was one of the first Nigerians ever to be voted as one of the world's best players on the on the list. Now, on the second question, you spoke about promises. Um, it is in our culture, kind of. You know, we, we, we get moved with the moment. What is happening? We all start to talk. We all start to make promises. And when the time comes to cash in, we we'll find out that okay, something is missing in the bank somewhere. But that notwithstanding, that is we have to accept it like that. I would prefer they don't promise, but the players come and they just give. Because I think that would be better. Okay. Victor Sergi. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rufi. But the truth still remains that the box stops at the NFF table. Because you can't tell me of a league that has 20 clubs in the MPFL that at least let, let's go let's go with the 30 players. Let's say they register 30 players out of 600 players. You can't tell me we can't get at least five that are very good to be in the national team. That's unacceptable. I have been an advocate of the league because I played 20 seasons in the league. I know what it is. Growing up playing in the league is the confidence that we have, the motivation that we have is. When you do well in the league, you have an up. You, you will be selected to the national team. Be it U20, be it U23, be it the Super Eagles. You will be given an opportunity to get to the national team. But today is no longer there. So I don't know what the NFF tell the coaches when they recruit them. You know, it, it's so sad to see that a, a, a league as Nigeria, we cannot even produce one player outside. They've, it's like they've just slotted that uh, 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 the goalkeeper's position to to the home base. Uh, players that one go in fact they willed it let me use the word will they willed it to to the home base players is that one slot for goalkeeper that is supposed to be there that's not nice i played in the league i got my my first call up against angola from the league i was top scorer in 2002 and i had a, an, an invite almost immediately to the national team and i went there and i proved myself that's why these boys are there if you don't give them this opportunity to showcase themselves they will have problems that's why you see they're running to anywhere any obscure country that offers anything, they're out of the country. We've got talent. These things have to change. I saw Pesero in uh, in June last year when they were playing the Super Six in the in Lagos. I told him every day you come to the stadium, you come, you put laptop in front of you, you watching players, and but you don't invite them. And then he said, uh, no, he will invite some. Yes, actually, he now invited about two, three, four. But he didn't play them. You can't be inviting players and you don't play them. Even when we are playing friendly games against teams like Serie Lone. Friendly games are for, for are games for you to showcase themselves uh, or the new players you brought into the team. But I think what Pesero is doing, he wants to win every game. Even if he's playing area area market women, he wants to win. That's not football. You have to try the new players you've brought into the team. When you don't give them opportunity to play, nobody sees them. Nobody knows that they can even play. If Mwabali was not given an opportunity, we wouldn't have seen him. He would have still stuck with Uzoho. So he needs to give the home base players it at least the minimum of five should always be in the national team for, for major competitions like this. Who knows? The last one we won was won by home base players. So that tells you that there is talent in the league, but it's just for the NFF to stand and say, look, you have to include these boys to your, to your team. If not, we will keep going back and forth. Okay, gentlemen, I, I would like both of you to um, help us uh, do an assessment of the quality of play and the quality also of officiating uh, so far. We've seen some coaches uh, that have been uh, sent away uh, by their various countries, but in terms of what we see on the screen, uh, how, how does this quality of play, you know, footballing, how does it compare with what you know, what you have seen, what you think should be the uh, uh, standard? I'll start with you, uh, Victor, and I see that in the background there are some talents uh, running up and down. Who are those ones? Are those the, uh, are they Bayesa Igus? Or, you know, <laughs> do I see, <laughs> you know, but just tell us what is in the background. Okay. I'm just we're curious. Playing, but there are an assessment of quality. Okay, we're, we're, play, we're actually playing a game for, for ABRV. 
Uh, he's just retired from uh, civil service after 35, 35 years of meritorious service. Okay. And that's why I'm in Bayelsa. We came to honor him. He has done well. He, he's, he's our guy. He's a great guy. That's why I'm here. Okay, back to AFCON. This is the most explosive AFCON ever that I have watched. And I know you will agree with me. In terms of everything, quality, in terms of goals, the, the highest amount of goals, the referees, yes, the, the one or two slight mistakes. VAR, VAR has been perfect. Even people say the VAR is very, very more effective than that of the EPL, you know, but there's nothing we can do about it. You know, overall, I will tell you this year's AFCON is the best so far that, I'm, I, that me, I have watched or I have seen, and everybody can attest to that as well. You know, it tells us that, look, African football is growing. That's why we can see most of the big teams that everybody expected to be there to up to at least the semifinal Finals, they were all knocked out, some in the group stages, some in the knockout stages. You know, it tells you that, look, African football is getting somewhere. If we continue in this vein, I can assure you that, look, by the next AFCON, it will look as if it's a World Cup we're playing. Okay, uh, back to you, uh, Sunday. The quality of play, the quality of refereeing, and the coaches that were fired for not delivering. Well, as regards coaching, uh, being fired is part of the job. The moment you sign, you know that you're going to get sacked eventually. So that's, it's always that's part of the job of football. Um, but as regards the quality of the game, I will say in the past 20 years, this is the best um, Afghan I have seen. Uh, totally as regards teamwork, the way the teams play, and the intelligence, the tactical knowledge of the African players has evolved so much. Well, most of the play teams have been eliminated because the African teams now are now very, very compact when they are without the ball. And the physical input that the players bring in when they're playing at the African uh, Nations Cup is totally different from what you see at the World Cup. I personally, when you talk about the refereeing, I am so happy that the referees have been spot on. Because at the last World Cup, working with the FIFA Technical um, Study Group uh, Committee as a technical expert in Qatar, it saddened me that not even one African referee was able to blow a match all through the tournament. So this one, I think, is a good argument for us to be able to push now that at least an African referee should be allowed to blow. And it saddens me also that in Nigeria, we don't even have one in this tournament. So I think it's time we really find a solution for this. All right. Okay. So this again is for both of you with regards to, uh, they say, if you want to go into battle, you have to study your enemy or study, mm. no, we're well, not enemy in this case, opponent. And so all eyes and the study will now be on the uh, Cote d'Ivoire team. Of course, they have home advantage. They are hosting the World Cup, they, I mean, the um, AFCON 2023, and they want this um, um, as much as Nigeria wants this. However, I'm sure you'd watched um, their play yesterday with Congo. Um, they were able to finish that in within the um, time, um, the stipulated time, the regulation time. They were able to finish that then. They didn't have to go to penalties and the like. But what would you say is, one, their strongest point, that's the um, Ivory Coast team, the Cote d'Ivoire team, and then their weak point where Nigeria can take advantage. I know we don't want to spill our secrets on air because they might be watching as well, but it'd be great to get your assessment <laughs> of, the, uh, of our opponents come Sunday. I'll start with very you Sunday. Smart, yeah. <laughs> very smart of you. I totally agree, my dear. <laughs> um, personally, um, to start with, um, yesterday when I was watching, I was praying that um, um, Congo wins. Yeah. Because I, I feel the better, easier thing for us to manage. And as regards, and as regards the fact also of the fans' support and everything, it's perfect for us. But um, if you're talking about the, the, the strengths of these of this, um, Ivorians, it's mental. They started, they were dead, they were out, they were scared. So now they are mentally, they are growing, the nation is growing with it. And that's where the big problem will be because they, are, they will be playing for their lives motivated and everything. But where, I will not go into our, where we can deal with them, but one thing I can, because you are right, uh, whatever I say goes viral, especially when it comes to my, on, on internet, so one has to be careful. Um, so I won't spill our, our secrets in point, but I am very confident for one thing, is that we can be attacked. And they stand us when we come forward, especially with Usimen and um, Aruno. And, uh, and, and Lukman, I mean, and um, also the, the players that we have up front, and they stand up. That is where I am very optimistic. All right. 
Victor, your take on this. Don't spill too much, like we've said. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what we say, no matter what we see here, it's what the players see on the field that they will play. It doesn't really matter. You know, sometimes the coaches will tell you play from the right side. What if the ball is not coming to the right side? You have to adjust. So it's not about what we say or what we don't say. Well, the, the truth still remains that what's going for the Ivorian team is I, I can see a massive unity in them. You know, uh, football has been very funny. If we go back history lane in 2000, Euro 2000, Denmark didn't qualify for, for the Euros. You know, but they came through the back door. I think either a team was suspended or they, they withdrew. Denmark was brought back in and they went on to win the, the championship. You know, football is, that's just my worry. Because the Ivorians, they came from the back door and they have been so solid in this competition. But I think overall, what's been going for them, like uh, uh, Sunday said, is their mental strength. You know, they, they were people that they believed they were already out to the point that they even sacked their coach, thinking they were down and out. But then luck <laughs> smiled on them. When people come back like this in competitions, most times they go ahead to win it. That's the only worry i have but you know it won't happen this time anyways because uh, we will we'll definitely bring the trophy back home we, we've got attackers that are fast if they can apply themselves in the game just the way they did in the second half the first half they weren't too good but if they apply themselves using their speed and using the, the flanks hitting them on counter we can outrun them because we have attackers that are faster than their defenders i think that's one point that will really help us and the boys need to understand that look this opportunity might never come their way again in their entire playing career so they have to seize this opportunity and make good use of it and bring back the trophy let's do it again i mean thanks thank so much victor we're talking about that famous 1992 danish team you know that got in there the land drops of this world and other great players that won the euro cup in, in 92 but after all of this what next because that's one question we don't always have how do we consolidate this team in 2013 we had the likes of the Mumba and all of that not where are the Mumba today, you know? Uh, Godfrey or Boy Bonner, how did that pan out? After some time, they fizzle out. How can we get like a sustainability framework, you know, probably for like the next 10, 15 years for our team? And that's why we still have you as a reference factor. And I'm sure probably at your time in the Super Eagles where you were coach, this is what you were trying to put in place. You know, how do we have that sustainability framework so that we don't just have a flash in the pan? You know, probably mm. the 94 team, when they got to the early 2000s, maybe after Mali Dobio do that, you know, things fizzled out. I, I think when they, when they came in, and it didn't take people like you to the World Cup, and he brought his own new team. He had the likes of Bartolomeu Ogbechi and all of that. And we all remember what happened. That was it. You know, that was how your generation was just <laughs> phased out. How do we have sustainability? Well, um... That's a very good question, this one, because it's something I was discussing with my wife only enough two days ago. Um, you see, we won the AFCON 2013. But let's not forget that with the same player, you know, being led with players like the Obi Mikel and all that, we didn't even qualify for the AFCON with 2015. With the same coach, which is a top coach in Stephen Keshi, we, we, we were able to qualify. So the rot already started immediately after we won that 2015. Now, when I came in and everything, my objective was to create a team that will, you know, soar in the next years. There you have to work with you. And when you have to work with you, that's what we try to be, you know. And I brought in players like uh, Alex Iwobi, uh, Ndidi, even uh, Ian Acho. I gave him his first color, you know, because that was what it is. And, this, and Ahmed Musa, you know, pushed him to the forefront. He's still the captain till today. So the thing there is that with our country, we get excited, and then we have people who grow big heads and everything. The 94 said, what the difference with those players? And that is what the advice I will give these players now is that it doesn't matter what you say or what you do. People will judge you, uh, people will judge you with what you do and how you make them feel. If you win, this is a chance for you to bring something and to go into the record. Not only to win it for Nigeria. The solution to Nigeria is very simple. You cannot keep ignoring your local league. If you ignore the local league and the home base, you will never be able to have a, a consistency. And that's why when I came in as a coach, what I did was that, and I, I must thank Amaju Pini for this. He gave me the opportunity to train the, the home base players on a regular basis, and I picked some of them. And those players, when I, when I worked with them, you know, 
take up the level of training, make them train like we do in Europe at the top level, at the top clubs. I saw these boys improve vastly and they all went abroad. They all became professionals afterwards. People don't talk about it, but almost all the team I took to Chan, they all became professionals immediately afterwards. So you see, there is so much quality in Nigeria. You cannot have 220 million people. Then our football is a religion. Look at, look at yesterday. Look at how Nigerians came together. People forgot you are Igbo, Hausa, uh, or, or Yoruba. They all came together because if Nigeria is one, and that is why I don't believe in identifying with tribal uh, anything. No, you know, I am, a, well, I am from Delta Igbo, like we, like we are called. But the thing that is, I still don't see myself as Igbo, Hausa, or Yoruba. For me, we are Nigeria. And as long as we don't get that in our head, that Nigeria is one, we cannot be consistent. All right, Victor, you want to have a stab at this? Sustainability? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, uh, the, the ball also stops at the NFF table because uh, you have to direct what happens, not just allowing the coaches to invite whoever they want to invite. Because in a situation where a new coach comes in, he wants to come with his own players. We can't continue reshuffling players week in, week out like that. Now, look at a team that is doing so well in the AFCOM. There is nothing wrong in keeping them together and bringing some new ones. Yeah, there are some that are basically going to retire after this tournament that we think they should should retire you know after one winning the AFCON if they win it even if they don't win it they should retire from the team they don't have any business any longer in that by a good team then then you should not bring in the, the younger ones and blend them together let there be continuity the only thing that runs very well in football is continuity a situation where you start every after every competition you scatter everybody and another competition you build after the competition you scatter again we can't continue that way we just have to continue that there has to be continuity where you know that there is a loophole you now try to block that loophole then we can continue that way some friendly games to bring in some new players let's see what they can offer you know a situation where you you depend solely on these players it becomes a problem and that's why i have always criticized Pesero because he has always talked to one set of players that it either means that there was no competition whatsoever in the super eagles camp any longer because the boys they know you come rain come shine they will be invited that's that's not it. Footballers have been invited to their national team based on their current form, not what you played before. So a player that is not playing for his club cannot come to, to use the national team as a rehab. It doesn't work that way. Players are invited based on current form. So I think we have to sustain this team and then add some fresh legs and then the ones that are good to go, let them just give way. Well, thank you very much, uh, Victor Isegi. Thank you also, uh, Sunday Olise, for joining us. Uh, we hope that uh, after Sunday, we will meet again uh, to come and celebrate. Thank you very much for joining us.